Hi folks, this is Jay. I hope you're okay folks and uh, it's good to be with you. I just got a special guest today and I really appreciate him coming on to have a chat and it's Bernie and it's good to see you Bernie and thanks for coming on and uh, I look forward to having a chat with you bro. Hi Jay, saying greetings from Portland, Oregon. Good to see you bro, from Manchester mate and have a good Christmas tomorrow yeah or is it, okay. is it Christmas there today or? No, today is the 24th yeah. Oh, right. All right, hey, well, have you? Uh, hey, by the way, have you heard of uh, Sunday Assembly? Sunday Assembly. Yeah. No. In, Le no. in London, it started in London. Sunday Assembly. No, no. Oh, it's called the Church Without the God Bits, and uh, they they kind of went all around the world, and I help on a local chapter here. I thought you would know about that since you're in the UK. Is it is it um, like a atheist running uh, like doing church? It's thing. basically uh, it's basically for anybody of any religion. They um, it's kind of like imagine a world where religion was no longer relevant, like in Star Trek, for example, and basically just coming together and singing pop songs and listening to inspirational messages based on science and reason and things like that. So it's an interesting experiment. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if I lost some connection with you there. For example, and basically just coming together. Did we, we? It sounds like did we lose some connection? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Go on, keep keep going, Bernie. I, I can't. I can't see you. But if you if you we're oh. still on, we're still on the Google Hangout, bro. Okay. Well, I was just mentioning. It. Maybe I'll talk a little slower since we're going over the long uh, internet wire over the ocean. I guess. Um, yeah, Sunday Assembly is a. They call it a church without the God bits. Uh, so basically, they do popular singing, popular songs, and have lectures based on science and reason. It's it's like as if in the future, a thousand years from now, God is irrelevant because nobody cares anymore. You have noticed uh, one or two uh, things like that uh, popping up in the UK, uh, but yeah. Uh, so it'd be interested if uh, if you got a, a website link or anything that people could mm. look at, bro, or uh, anything. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try to send it to you later. But it started in the UK, so I thought you might be familiar with it. Um, not that particular one. Not that particular one, bro. Okay. So it's over to you if you want me to start or if you want to start. Yeah, I'll let you start. Um, I think we talked about, I, I said I think it'd be uh, interesting to talk about the um, reasons for believing in the existence of God because a lot of these other debate questions stem from that, like uh, what is the meaning of life and what is morality and all that stuff. That it all The answer changes whether God exists or not. So it seems to me the most important question is, uh, does God exist? So I thought that'd be an interesting thing to talk about. Okay. Well, I, I looked at a couple of your uh, shows, a couple of your videos today, and you kind of seem to bring up four things. Uh, you ask questions about Adam and Eve. You ask questions about uh, Noah's Ark, uh, and one about morality, and then one about why is there something? Why is there something rather than nothing or something? So I watched a few videos where you bring up those questions, and so I've thought about it. And I think for for me, I can't. Uh, Bernie, there, there's no way I can match you on the scientific stuff today because I haven't been able to to do the research because uh, you normally bring up uh, stuff about DNA and things like that. So I'd need more time to research that. Um, for me, I think that it comes down to rationality because all these arguments that you use and uh, in defence of your position. Uh, uh, and if you look at the history of Western thinking for the last two or three hundred years, I think it comes down to rationality and an explanation of rationality. So for me, um, one of the things that I find compelling is is the um, uh, 
uh, transcendental argument, which uh, Greg Banson uses, um, uh, or, or has used, and that is to say that we can't know anything without uh, positing God. So, for example, the laws of logic, the basic laws like the law of non-contradiction, Well, I just wait because it seems to be sticking. If, 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 if logic is uh, material and something that we've invented, then how does that work in a, a scientific, materialistic construct? Well, if, uh, first, well, first off, when you say materialistic, I think a better word, if we could agree, would be naturalistic worldview. Uh, um, you could say I'm a materialist. I'm a materialist, but the the thing that kind of um, is misleading about that is people think of material like it's a substance. And for example, at the time of the Big Bang, it said that there is no material whatsoever. There's nothing solid. There's just pure energy. And then according to E equals MC squared, uh, energy can transform into matter. And that's where all the matter came from, the Big Bang. So, so just to be clear, um, I don't believe that matter is everything. I mean, there's energy also. And there was energy, all energy before matter, most likely, in, in this I, universe. But when I say materialistic, I'm, I mean it in that broader spectrum of, of, of whether it be matter, mm -hmm. whether it be energy, it's some kind of substance. Well, energy is not a substance. Well, I don't, I don't want to argue about words. It's something, it's rather than nothing, is it not? Sure, sure. Yeah, well, but I mean, usually, that, that, but usually, a, but usually, a substance has like electrons, neutrons, protons, and all that, and energy does not have any of that. Well, I'm not, I'm not using it in, in, in a sort of scientific sense. I'm just using it in a broad, general sense of trying to say that there's some things that are there rather than not there. Sure, sure. Yeah. Semantics. The 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 issue is is about. Do you regard the laws of logic, those basic laws, like the law of non-contradiction, are they uh, material in in terms of uh, relational to matter? Are they related to energy, or are they immaterial and not related to them at all? Yeah, they seem to me uh, they're immaterial. But I would also like to say that. There are certain questions that philosophers with PhDs will argue amongst themselves. Like, for example, one question is, do numbers really exist ontologically? Do they exist somewhere? And somebody might say, like, well, of course they exist. I could see two, uh, two ducks in my duck pond. And it's like, well, you see two, but that's not, there's, that's not really a two in nature. That's a human construct. And so do numbers actually exist? And I heard William Lane Craig, you know, who's the most popular... Christian debater. Um, did I lose you? I think. Okay. I'm not sure if we lost connection. I was going to say William Lane. William Lane Craig is the most popular Christian debater, and he says, it's, you know, it's the, this is something that philosophers debate about, like even if numbers exist. And so, I, did I lose you again? Okay. So I think. So I so I think numbers are kind of like morality. So numbers and morality. Are, are like the same question, you know, do these ontologically exist? Um, okay. I'm not sure how well, much you got that because it seemed like my video feed was getting messed up. I, I missed a little bit, but I, I respect what you're saying, but there seems to be a contradiction there because you're saying that that logic is immaterial and then you're saying that there's a debate about the ontological significance of numbers which posits the possibility from, correct me if I'm wrong, from your side that numbers would be a projection of the mind. So how does logic that is that you've said and admitted is immaterial mm -hmm. work with, in, in terms of the mind? If, okay, if, logic, so if, if logic is immaterial, does it have an ontological status within the mind? And if it does, how can it be immaterial when the mind is material yeah so what i was trying to say as a general overview is that numbers morality and logic they're all in the same boat even time does time exist they're all in the same boat these are things that philosophers with phds will argue about but that that that, that that's 
bro, Bernie, mm. I, I respect you for your, you know, when I'm listening to you on the, you know, I've watched a couple of your videos and what, what I find about you is you're very confident and you know your stuff, you know, so I, I wouldn't even begin to tussle with you on scientific stuff because I know you know your stuff and I'd need a few weeks to do my research. But you, if, if, if a creationist came on and responded like that, you, you, would, you, you would do the Bernie smile. You know that little smile where you know that you've, you've kind of like, that's not cutting. You, just to say that philosophers debate or discuss, you've made a statement that you said that logic is immaterial. Now, mm -hmm. is the brain material? And if the brain well, is material, well, okay. how, so, how did the two connect? Okay. So, okay. So I said what I said about I, what I'm trying to say is that people much smarter than 10 times smarter than both of us argue about these things in philosophy. Okay. So that's just background. So now I'll go forward with you and talk to you logically based on my understanding. But the big picture is if you say, how did the laws of logic come to be? I would say the big question is, I don't know. Well, the, the law of non-contradiction was discovered by Aristotle. Uh, it was debated by, it was try, uh, Hegel tried to negate it. But, you, but if it's something that we've invented or, or it's a social construct, then it's not really, you know, everything that you've been doing, you're arguing for, for against creationists uh, and everything that we're doing. No, no, I would, I would, no, wait, I would not say it's a social construct. Okay. I, well, I, I think I think we have agreement that it's something that's separate from time, space, matter, and all that stuff. It's it's something that transcends that. Okay, so is it something that is created by the mind mind itself, even though it's not a social construct? Well, like you like you said, uh, I, I agree with you. I think we think similarly that it's um, discovered. So it, but. You've admitted that it's immaterial, but is it a projection? Is that is the is is basic laws of logic? Is it something a, a projection of the mind, or is it something that is also? I lost your video there. Can you repeat the question? The 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 issue is is that you've admitted that it's the law of lo the, the basic laws are immaterial which to me that is very big of you that's very honest for you to do that but it seems to me then there seems to be a bit of a trouble there is that from what i know of what what i've seen of your videos you're very sci you know one of the big things for you is you're you're very scientifically orientated this the, this is the big thing that you would be believing in, in some kind of uh, materialist understanding of the brain that the brain is material and therefore well, instead of instead of saying material can you say naturalistic i think it's it makes more sense it's okay. more clear okay if you want me to do that uh, okay. i'll do that bernie yeah if it, okay. if, it if it's uh from a naturalistic uh perspective on the brain so how could, could you just i'm not trying to trick you i just i'm just trying to how do you connect the two how how are the two connected? How's logic that is immaterial, basic laws? Because there's logic that brain to this immaterial logic. How do you how do you get the two together? Okay, I think I lost I think I lost half of your question, but um, I got some of the words. So the way it seems pretty clear that we have the physical brain and from the physical brain emerges a mind just like blood flow emerges from the heart and the circulatory system you've got the mind which is an activity of the brain so there's i don't see anything um supernatural going on there so, uh, so is, is, yeah go ahead no go on go on I'll, i'm listening bro so and then as far as morality i mean not morality as far as logic it it seems like um 
it seems like there's logical truths out there and we're i don't I, like i said i don't know i i i'm kind of like you where it's not something i'm an expert at i i i, I think you'd it seems like that's a very difficult question for even people with phds to understand well to me um it, it goes to the heart. If you look at the history of the Enlightenment, if you look at Kant and, and the great philosophers and the great scientists up to the last 200 years, the key, the issue of, of this, all this creation, evolution and all this, it all comes down to rationality and how we understand rationality and, and who whose position is most rational. And, you know, and so if we can't really grapple with this question of the nature of rationality, because that's the key, because when I'm listening to you debating, you know, you, what, you're, what you're doing is you want to explain things in a rational way and you believe that your position is a more rational position. And, and I respect that position. And, 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 and so this issue of logic and the nature of logic is not just a philosophical pie in the sky or a, a, it is a very deep debate, at which you're quite correct mm. to say that. And I think that's really right to say that. <laughs> I'm Bernie. You know, when you when you look at your side of, of of the equation, when you look at your scholars and thinkers, and you look at our side and whatever, you, I, personally, this is my own thinking. Uh, reading the history of the Enlightenment, is it all comes down to ultimately uh, whose understanding of rationality is the best? Because these debates about DNA, the complexity of DNA, and and then the respond the rejoiners that you make with your arguments of using DNA and uh, the similarities between apes and, and humans and all these arguments that you're using, uh, you're, 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 you're bringing in uh, rationality uh, and, and, and trying to understand things in a rational way. So this is a, the, this is a very important topic. I'm not using this as mm. some would use to get away from evidential stuff because if you say to me, Jay, okay, let's have a debate on evolution. If you give me a few weeks on it, I'll do the research for you and I'll look at, you send me the papers, I'll read it. But I think it is an important topic and you are right, it is quite deep. But I think I think that I need to engage in it more and I think also you need to engage in it more, bro. Well, let me, let me give a, well, my opinion is the question doesn't matter at all because we have an agreement that rationality is important. Logic and reason is important. So we already have a common ground. So uh, from my perspective, what we need to do is move forward. And for example, when I talked to Kent Hovind, um, when I talked to Kent Hovind, he's a young earth creationist. He says there's no evidence for evolution. I say there is evidence for evolution. So we have common ground of logic and reason. The whole debate is over the evidence. It has nothing to do with where did logic come from? Another thing, another thing I want to say about what you said is you said you have your side, I have my side, but there's no such thing when it comes to evolution because you can find evangelical Christians like Francis Collins. In fact, most of, a, most of the scientists, even if they're religious, they accept evolution. So evolution is not an atheistic thing. There is no your side. There is no Christian side to evolution. There's a lot of Christians that accept evolution. Okay, I think I think uh, if I can come back at you, that is that my my expertise is historical Jesus studies, not not in uh, evolution like you and, and stuff like that. Um, and in and in historical historical Jesus studies, uh, there's a guy called Dominic Crossan who's a skeptic, and uh, he was uh, challenged by James White, and James White said there are presuppositions that we have to put on the table, and he said, and and in his Irish accent, he said, yeah, but there's de data, he said. So he's agreeing with you there in terms of there's data that we've got to look at and there is common ground. But there is there is a, a complex interplay between evidences and our presuppositions. There, there is that complex interplay. And so, yes, there is common ground, but at the same time, we do have to look at the nature of evidence. And I would totally agree. We also have to be aware that we come to the evidences with different colored glasses, that you come to the evidence with your atheist glasses. I come to my evidence with Christian glasses. The Hindu comes to it with their glasses. So there is evidences, 
and we can share common ground but we are but okay. that but we have to be careful that we do come into it with uh biases and like for example you've you've been on record on one of your videos of saying that you are i think is it a philosophical naturalist or a or something right. like that yeah so you're on record saying that now that is a an important philosophical construct to to the way you're going to view evidences okay but here's something that totally undermines everything you've just said i was a born again i was raised a catholic and then uh in college i became a born again evangelical christian for over 25 years, I was a born-again evangelical Christian, growing in the faith, even went to seminary and got a seminary degree. So my, for me, it's not about... I'm, I'm waiting for the video to catch up here. For me, it's not about um, presuppositions because I had that belief. I would have remained a Christian if I could still have enough to believe in. I did I didn't. I didn't think there was still a thread of enough to grasp onto to believe in. But we can also catch presuppositions, like we can catch the measles. You know, you can catch a, you can have one presupposition, and then it can be undermined by another presupposition. So, so we, you know, th things can come in. You know, and it's you know, it depends what culture you're in and how you know if you're, if you're going to a university and you're listening to lecturers uh, you could catch the presuppositions without you uh, realizing it but the, the, the point is what, what the issue is here the important issue is all I'm saying is is that this issue about logic and the nature of logic exposes certain philosophical constructs within your mm. presuppositions in mind and and it, it's about whether your presupposition matches mm. the reality of of what you're saying or what i'm saying right. okay let me let me uh let me tell you something do you have you heard of there's a logical fallacy called confirmation bias do you know what that is i have but I, you'll have to refresh me have, I, i've just did a lot of so, logical fallacies today yeah so confirmation bias um it doesn't seem like a logical fallacy because usually logical fallacies have to do with bad logic, but I've, I've seen it listed as a logical fallacy. So basically confirmation bias means you believe something. And then when you look at the evidence, you try to interpret it in light of what you believe. Yeah. And what yeah. you should do is try to look at evidence more impartially based on what makes the most facts. And when I was a Christian, my presupposition was I wanted to believe. I did not want to leave the faith. When I became an atheist, it was bad news for me. It was a depressing way to go, but I had to fig I figured I had to pick the truth over what feels good. So I did not want to leave the faith. My presupposition was for Christianity, but I was open-minded and I wanted to follow the truth. And so I had to go against my presupposition at that point. At that point. And basically, I don't even like the word presupposition because it sounds like the same thing as confirmation bias. This is, this is a bad thing. Presuppositions are a bad thing in science and logic. Well, I, I would disagree. I think you can't discuss the nature of evidence without discussing the nature of presuppositions for example if you look at the history of historical jesus studies Raynan came to the to, to the life of christ with his uh trying to be objective and scientific in his understanding of christ uh strauss tried to do the same boltman's tried to do the same but uh, boltman created a jesus in his existential philosophy strauss created a jesus in his uh, german philosophy and Raynan created a Jesus out of his French philosophy, and so. And then you, and then you had Muhammad, and then you also had no, Muhammad no. and Joseph Smith later no, making more no, Jesuses too. No, 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 but burn it, burn it. But the point is, is that they did w what you're saying. They w tried to look at it scientifically and objectively, but the, in the end, they created a Jesus out of their own image. So what I'm saying is, I totally agree with.
with you in historical Jesus studies. Date is important. I don't disagree with that. I don't discount that. And I know that you get frustrated when creationists maybe use presuppositional apologetics to get away from looking at the data. So I, I, I appreciate what you're saying there. But I... I think at a higher philosophical level, if you read books like Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, where he's grappling with evidences and presuppositions, you'll find that you cannot get away from this issue of presuppositions. It's not a case of, uh, of just confirmation bias. It's, it's about looking at your presuppositions and saying, saying whether, they are, whether they comport to reality. And your presupposition that, uh, that, there is, that logic is immaterial does not comport with your naturalistic uh, position because you know that you believe that the brain is a material object and how does that work within your position and it's no good just saying it's all about confirmation bias let's move on to data but we can go on to another topic if you want I think we've exhausted this one. well it seems to me like you're mixing some things up too um, when you talk about um, trying to prove logic that's the, the the thing is like i said we have a starting point we agree about logic we're not trying to disagree over whether logic is good or bad or how it works we we agree to basic logic i personally think most of the problems with young earth creationists like kent hoven for example is he is scientific naive scientifically naive like i asked him if he knew about fused human chromosome number two and then he said yes and we talked about it and then it became obvious he didn't know the argument so you know he says there's no evidence for evolution and i and i asked another apologist about this and he said he he wasn't really familiar with these arguments and, and i as far as i'm concerned you're not really in, uh, an apologetics. You're not even in the game until you understand the evidence for evolution. You cannot, you cannot say there's no evidence for evolution without being aware of the evidence. And the evidence is really quite deep and it's quite amazing and it's out there. It's not like it's a hidden secret or something. It's, there's tons of evidence out there on so many different levels, on, on DNA, on biodiversity. There's just so much science out there and... It's, it's really true that in order to not understand you, it, to not accept but, that, you have to be naive, I think, but, scientifically. But, but even if I granted you all that you say is correct, mm -hmm. you would still undermine your position because your position is rationality. You're trying to be rational. And if you're trying to be rational... You, you, you're doing science and presenting arguments and evidence and saying that there's a solid position here but you're you so I, I grant you your argument and even if I grant you that argument you still don't get there to where you want to go and that is this is that you're using rationality and that rationality cannot be explained in your worldview so, well, okay. even, so if, even if I granted you your argument your own argument would implode on itself because your argument is clear logical arguments yeah so if I grant you that it would actually implode upon yourself because how do you get logic how do you get rationality from nature from natural selection and mutation which is not rational how does that comport so wait, with your with your position okay so just to back up a little bit are we in agreement about the laws of logic that they exist? Yes, yes. Okay. So so really the question is where do the laws of logic come from and do does that require a designer? That's that's what your argument is, right? Uh, no, my arg my argument is is that if you're positing rationality how you want to frame it is up to you. What I'm saying is this if you're positing a rationality, if you're positing a position for evolution, you are make you are presenting evidence, you are presenting logic, logical reason, and arguments, right? That yeah, and, that's, that, and, and we've already agreed on that. Yeah, yeah, but that presumes that the nature of reality is rational. And if that's yeah, but we've case, already we've already agreed on that point. Yeah, wait a minute. But if that is the case, 
Yeah, but what we've not agreed on is you've not given a rational position for why that nature of reality is rational. And that's the issue. And your okay, so worldview, that's, that's, uh, your worldview, that's, your, your, wait, can I just finish? Your worldview and your position assumes that it does not give any rationale for it. So what what you're doing is it's still um, it, it, it's still a, a, a jump of faith or a, 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 a so re really it, what you're doing is you're undermining actually you're undermining your position because. On the one hand, you want your cake and eating it. You're saying, here's, here's it. reality is rational. We can get data for evolution, and I can show you rationally that this is correct. And yet at the same time, your own position is irrational in the sense that the mutation and natural selection and then going before that uh, abi abiogenesis and then before that, whatever it is, a Big Bang or... Um, any, uh, an infinite regress in the universe or whatever, string theory, whatever that is, none of that comports to any rational basis because um, the, there is a lack of um, uh, whereas in the Christian position, God is rational by nature. And so therefore, if we're made, if the universe is made and if we're made, then it explains why there is rationality, why we can have rationality. But without that personhood at the beginning of the equation, it seems impossible to, to, move, to, to, to connect the two from uh, a Big Bang to abiogenesis to natural selection and mutation to rationality. And that's the issue. It's not the, the evidence that you posit and the logic implodes upon itself because it is not able to give a foundation of rationality. So, so basically, like I said, the whole, the whole point of your, your question is asking the question, what is the foundational basis of um, logic and reason? That's what you're trying to say, right? Okay. That's your whole question. And you're trying to say, I have no basis. And you're trying to say that you do have a basis because of your belief in God, right? On presuppositions, yeah. Okay, so that's 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 a whole different discussion versus. I mean, that that has nothing to do with evolution because when we talk about evolution, we we go forward and we say, okay, we agree to laws of logic and all that. Now let's look at the evidence. No, it does because so, if you read Alvin Plantinga. If you read Alvin Plantinga, I think he's written a paper on this. He 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 written a good paper where he says, if evolution is correct, it would actually implode upon itself. It would actually negate mm -hmm. rationality. So I mean, no, he, no, yeah, I, I know what he says, and he, and he's totally goofy about this. He's basically saying that, evol he's saying by definition, evolution is for. Um, Basically, survival of the fittest is about filling an ecological niche. It is not about determining truth. And so there's no reason to believe in evolution that humans would evolve to determine truth, which I think is a really silly argument because evolution is really an arms battle and the development of the mind is part of that. And in this struggle for survival, we have to develop our mind, and that involves developing truth because science, for example, gives us the best weapons like nuclear technology, and nuclear technology is hardcore science. But so to me, it's very obvious that evolution does, I mean, um, our, our brain power and truth-seeking does help evolution. But you're uh, it's just kind of a silly argument from him. It's not a silly argument. You're actually negating what you're saying. You're at, if you you see, uh, Doctor Meyer, I think it was Meyer who died a couple of years ago. He's a world authority on evolution. He said that evolution is a historical science, in the sense that we have to go back and look at it, look at history. If you look at Francis Ayala, who was uh, who, who's uh, a philosopher and uh, a biologist, and he he talked about in the 1950s where they the PhD students in biology were told not to use the word um, um, such a, uh, words like uh, design or purpose in, 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 in talking about biological structures because um, 
they they wanted they didn't want to give a sense about history had meaning or history had purpose because after after the nineteen fifties they were sick and tired of these historical meta narratives, and evolution itself is a historical meta narrative. It's a. It's I agree. A, I agree with that. Yeah. It, it, I, I I agree that evolution is a good alternative origin story. So it, it it's a view of history, an understanding mm -hmm. of history, and. Mm -hmm. In, exactly. that in that understanding of history, what you what you don't seem to realize is you're imploding on yourself every time you use an argument against me for the uh, existence of evolution. You're using rationality. You're implying that there is meaning to rationality. You're imply you're implying lots of these things that you're smuggling in, which you don't get from that position. Because how can you get meaning? How can you get rationality from natural selection? A mutation is natural. Is natural selection an intelligence? Is it a meaning? Is it a purpose, or is it just a blind force? And what you're doing is you're bringing in words, comporting words with meaning, purpose, rationality to a blind force, and and that is your that is your problem. And you're trying to have your cake and eat it philosophically, scientifically, and logically. That's my position. Well, there is there is intelligence um, in a lot of the higher order um, evolution. For example, mammals. You know, they they go. There's migration that takes intelligence. There's mating uh, rituals that takes intelligence. You know how uh, animals select their mates. So it's not just all blind mutation only. There's there's a there is a mental part to natural selection in the higher animals, at least. Probably not with you know the lower things like bacteria and viruses, obviously. But you can't have your cake and eat it. The the moment you give any meaning to any specific part of reality within creation, whether scientific or rational, you've negated your own position. Because how do you mm -hmm. get from a pro a historical process that has no meaning? That has no rationality. This is so every argument that you're going to use against me, you still what you're doing is you're smuggling in in a historical process that doesn't give you that foundation. Well, I, I would just say we, we both agree that logic is good and true. And the reason why, from my naturalistic viewpoint, is is because it works. That's the reason why we use logic. So there's nothing contradictory about logic and naturalism. Just like, like I said before, um, logic, numbers, time, these are all deep philosophical com uh, concepts that people argue about whether they even exist or if they're just things that humans use as models that work. You know, for example, like uh, we, used to, we used to say, obviously, space and time are two different things. Then Einstein came up with his theory of um, general relativity where, said, where he said they are not separate. There's a space-time fabric, and you can warp space and time by huge objects with the gravity. So space and time actually warps. So there's a lot of weird stuff out there that we are figuring out from science that totally don't make any sense from us because we did not evolve to understand that stuff. We evolved, it, we evolved in our middle world, as Dawkins would say it not in the small world or the large world. So that's why we don't understand things like quantum mechanics. They don't make sense to us because we don't operate on the quantum level. But science is a lot of weird things like that, and we accept it because of evidence and logic. We accept it because it works. We can make uh, predictions. We can make new scientific instruments. We can use all this stuff. And that's why we believe in logic, because it actually works. Well, I know that. I understand where you're coming from. And, you know, um the the issue of pragmatism um you, you know because it works uh, it's valuable i understand that but you know even in pragmatism there there is three four different views of pragmatism there's the dewey pragmatism uh, and uh rory pragmatism and stuff like that the the issue here i know i'm laboring it but the issue what i'm trying to get at is uh, if you look at history as a meta narrative Either history is rational or it's not rational. And what you're trying to do is say, uh, whenever you're using the scientific method, whenever you're bringing any evidence, what you're really doing is you're saying, look, 
I, I haven't really got a basis for rationality for history, really. The historical flow is mutations and natural selection. Mutations, I'm smuggling in that it's an intelligence. It's not, it's a force. And therefore, that's the issue. That's the issue. So every time you're using logic, reason, saying uh, from a pragmatic, <laughs> pragmatic argument, it, that's your ultimate foundation. So it, it, it all comes down to that. If you look at the Enlightenment, if you look at all these debates mm. with Dawkins, you, and uh, I've listened to loads of your debates. I've listened to lots of the uh, debates about evolution and creation and all these things. It, it ultimately comes down to this one question the nature of rationality and the basis of rationality. That's my, you know, I, I mean, I have a degree from Nazarene Theological Seminary, but it's accredited from Manchester University. And mm -hmm. I, I like to engage, I do like to engage. And if you send me stuff, I'll read it and I'll look at it. But I do like to read wider. And my understanding of history is that it's, this is the key question of all questions, rationality. But you but, you know, one of the funny things, though, is like when when people like you say that you believe in rationality and rationality comes from God and yet you reject evolution. That means that you believe animals appeared instantaneously by a miracle. Like, for example, there was a time where there's no humans and then boom, all of a sudden there's a time where you have adult humans. Well, if you looked at that adult human as soon as it was made, based on logic, you would be wrong because it looks like that that human adam and eve it looks like they're reproductive age like uh, you know teenagers but they're only one day old you just um well, you, you're just blowing away logic there that's that's counter logic that that is god being a deceiver because it looks like humans were around a long time i mean and they even have a language like in well, the Bible, the Adam and Eve had a language. So you're you're blowing away. You cannot believe in inductive logic because right there it blows away inductive logic. You can't trust your eyes. You can't trust anything because you may you may as well believe that you were just created five minutes ago or even five seconds ago with all your memories intact. How would you know? Maybe God. You can you can read a holy book where it says everything was created five seconds ago, including your memory. You just got to believe it on faith. There's no way to disprove it. I think, and then you say, and, and then you would say, oh, well, God's rational too, by the way. It's like, well, you can't be rational and, and believe in these radical miracle stories because they blow, they blow away um, logic. No, I, I, Inductive logic. I mean, I have, to, I have to hold my hands up. This is your expertise. It's not my, my expertise is, is in historical Jesus studies. Your expertise is you, you debate specifically on these topics or, I don't want to cross swords on the specifics because you'll know a lot more than me and I'd need a few weeks to do the to do the research. But what I would know from an academic point of view is that, you know, if you've got uh, data and evidences and uh, scholar scholarship and you want me to look at it, I will look at it and I'll engage with it. And anybody, whoever they are, should be willing to engage with any data or evidence. And if you put a if you put a collection of articles on the table for me, and want me to go away and read it, I will read it and come back at you and we can debate on the specifics of that. But what I would say is, is that when we're looking at so far back in time, that I think a lot of it comes down to interpretation of, of that data. So like I've seen you debate other other people and I think you've given some a good account of yourself and you've said some really good things that, that uh, I need to look into. But also I've heard some, some of the other guys um, um, I can't Rainer or whatever his, his name was. You know, he he gave yeah. a different he 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 gave a, a different spin sometimes on some of the things you said. I, I think he gave a good account of himself sometimes. Um, but yeah, I would agree that there there is a if there would be some evidences to comport uh, with uh, the biblical data. But I would also say that we wouldn't have all the data. So long as there's a, a plausibility structure there that is that is worth holding on to, that has some data, then I would I would say I can hold on to that. And my plausibility structure would be who Christ is, uh, the nature of morality and sin, and then uh, creation in terms of uh, the complexity 
of, of the cell and things like that. So I would say there is a plausibility mm -hmm. structure on on some of these uh, things, um, questions that you bring out on like the flood and things like that. That's not my kind of style of apologetics, but I mean, they're, a, they're good questions, uh, but I'd have to research all that um, personally, you know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, what I would say is that, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, I think, is interpretation of, of the data sometimes, a lot of the time. So, for example, when, when we're looking back at the flood uh, and catastrophe, you know, there, there are some uh, creationist scholars, even though you might not agree with them, who, who were people in, in, sci in the scientific community who, who were doing the stuff and they got converted and they've seen a different light, but they're seen as like hacks. It's like in the historical Jesus studies, the atheists, uh, from an academic point of view, the atheist community uh, are nowhere in the running when it comes to scholarship as compared to the conservative evangelicals or conservatives. For example, like N.T. Wright, you cannot compare N.T. Wright to a Richard Carey. You cannot compare an N.T. Wright to an Earl Daugherty or an N.T. Wright to Roger Price. So... But does that mean to say that I won't look at atheist scholars or not consider that they haven't got some important things? Sometimes it's just about interpretation, I think. Yeah, I don't know. You you have a high estimation of N.T. Wright. Um, I'm not... Well, I don't agree with Yeah, that. I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, we went way over our 30 minutes. Um, next time we'll do this, we have to figure out how to... we got a lot of dropped video there. We'll have to figure out how to do this without... Okay. Dropping video. Well, if if you wanna uh, do it again, and if you wanna mm -hmm. give a specific topic, let me know. Okay. And I, it'd be helpful. Then I could, if you send me the stuff that you want me to read, I can then engage with it properly rather than just <laughs> not engaging with it. I'll, I'll engage with it if you want me to think it through, mm -hmm. and I'll try. You know what? Yeah, one of the topics, one of the topics we could talk about is I sent you the link to my essay I wrote, and one of those was. I talked about how the gospel is nonsense. And so that might be an interesting uh, topic to talk about. Okay. Should we do that next time then? Yeah. But first we got to figure out how to get this technically to work out because this was way too choppy. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll stop broadcasting a minute and then have a good Christmas. And, and if we get right. in touch, touch with each other in the new year and then you can give you a bit of time to research it and I'll research it and then we can, Debate it again. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Have a, right. have a happy holidays. All right, thanks a lot, Bernie. Take care, mate. Okay. Take All right, care. bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity, mate. Okay, bye. Thanks a lot, man.